within our nature to cross the unknown, to seek what lies beyond the next ridge. From deep within us, there is an ancient need to wander, to explore. November 1978, an expedition of modern explorers set out in the tradition of Marco Polo and Lewis and Clark to go from the bottom of the world to the top, to cross some of the most forbidding jungle on earth, to make the longest overland journey on record. They were 14 Americans in six four-wheel drive vehicles. This is their story. The 21,000-mile trek begins in the cold and fog of Cape Horn, the tip of South America. But to Mark Smith, lumberjack, contractor, four-wheel drive specialist, and expedition leader, it is the fulfillment of a dream. More wheeling and a challenge, uh, something as a Darien uh, has been a challenge to me for, as I say, a 12-year period. It's just something I feel we can do. I think we feel we have the men, the equipment, the knowledge, and the background to do something like this. Ken Collins shares the dream and the leadership responsibility. We uh, made a couple of trips down into this country and uh, found that we felt that it really was possible. We heard all kinds of stories and discouraging tales, but uh, we're not people that are easily discouraged. The first days are a shakedown for men and machines. They charge north to the warmer weather, getting used to the food, sleeping by the side of the road, putting four, five, six hundred miles a day behind the wheel. They are preparing themselves and their vehicles for what is to come. These are ordinary Americans. They have jobs, families. They have financed this trip themselves. They are driving stock four-wheel drive vehicles. There is no sponsor or company to underwrite the costs or to provide specially prepared equipment. They have come together to share the dream, the adventure, the hardships, simply for the sake of doing it. Tim Stegan, at 19, is the youngest member of the group. His expectations will be met. We're just going to have to... to be like a family and communicate like a family and everyone will have to express their opinion when it comes to a, a situation where it's a group decision. Ken and Mike Arnold are brothers who share a common heritage with the land. Their ancestors were here when Columbus came. The reason I'm here is uh, the thrill of it, I think. I'm into different things that uh, interest me and this is one of them, jeeping got my wife's total backing and family's total backing and it was due to the fact that it was a one-time chance in a guy's life to see some country and maybe do something that not too many other people have done on the sixth day they crossed the foothills of the andes and the argentine border into the lake country of chile in the afternoon late they are welcomed by a band of wassos, or cowboys, who invite them to a fiesta. Hands across the border. Ronier and Chip Gash and their banjos become ambassadors at large wherever they go. The expedition continues north. It becomes a grueling hour by hour challenge to hold the road. Stay awake always maintain the schedule. 
The countryside speeds past. On the 13th day, they cross over again into the towering Andes. Stuart as Bjornsson remembers. I think the Andes were, were the most spectacular thing I saw. Probably the mountains are of a different origin than where I'm from. Where I'm from, they're volcanic. Here they seem to be just giant chunks of granite pushed up out of the ground. And the scale is just on another order than from what I'm accustomed to. They speed across the backbone of the continent. They are awed by the scale of the mountains. The immensity of the Andes, just, it's unbelievable how big they are. They just never seem to end. At one portion of our trip, we drove five days, very hard, day and night. Probably one of the most fantastic sights I've ever seen in my life. On the 21st day on the road, they leave the grandeur of the icy peaks for the parched earth of the dread Atacama Desert. The Indians say this is the place that God forgot. For two days, they cross the scorched and barren land. Finally, the last fuel stop in the desert. Plans are laid for some rest and relaxation as they enter into Peru. And again, the foothills of the Andes loom ahead. They must cross the mountain range for the third time. The schedule has been maintained, and there is time for the expedition to divide up and experience some of the most fascinating places in this hemisphere. One group opts for what some say is the most picturesque lake in the world, Titicaca, 12,000 feet high. On its shores, the fabled reed boat people, who, like their probable ancestors of the Nile, weave boats that can cross ocean. Another group climbs high into the Andes to find the ruins of a city that stood waiting, deserted, for nearly 500 years. This is Machu Picchu, the lost city of the Incas. Machu Picchu was found only in 1911 by Professor Hiram Bingham. The mist that covers the place really makes this place more mysterious. By the way, the mountain back there is Machu Picchu. That's the one. It means old peak. That's the actual meaning in the Inca language. But this is a modern name. The Inca name is lost. Mighty Iguazu Falls roars a welcome to other expedition members. Then the holiday is over. From their separate ways, the group bands together again in Bogota, Colombia. From here, the real challenge to the Expedition de las Americas will begin. All that has taken place up to now, the 10,000 miles of mountains and desert roads, are a warm-up for the assault on the Darien Gap. The gap is scarcely 200 miles wide, but it is 200 miles of swamp, jungle, and danger. The road runs out at a Colombian village called Turbo. There, the vehicles are loaded on a barge that will take them a day and a half into the jungle. For some, there are last-minute thoughts. Fred Roby, seaman and philosopher. Got one continent out of the way and ready to start in the gap. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of trials and tribulations that are going to test the whole crew. God willing, we're going to get something really, really important out of it, besides just crossing the gap. It's sort of a special place on the earth in that not many people have uh, made it across, and I guess it was planned that way. So if we can do it, it'll be uh, both a reward to us.
past. I don't know, just to the, just to the whole dream. And now the expedition faces the challenge they came for. This is the Darien Gap, crossed only once before by a major British Army expedition that paid a fearful toll in human life and months of hardships and fever. The dangers they've joked about are suddenly real. We have with us snake bite. The anti-venom was produced in two countries. We have some that was produced from a Colombian... Guide Tony Alfonso warns against panic. Anybody gets bitten by a snake, they should be as cool and calm and collected as possible. Not start running, just try to stay calm and we'll get the anti-venom to that person as quick as possible. On the morning of January 15th, the expedition enters the jungle. A deep, tropical jungle, remote from the outside world, is almost a primeval experience only a handful of outsiders have known. It is quite literally a steam bath. The temperature seldom falls below 100 degrees. The humidity the same. The sunlight barely filters through the greenery overhead. The mosquitoes are constant. To the expedition, experienced outdoorsmen that they are, it is still a hostile environment. And yet, it is a special place. Guide Carlos Martinez describes it like this. For me, the jungle is something like um, a big temple. Something that you admire, but you have to be very precautious. It is not anymore like uh, something that you're going to conquer. No, it is different. It is something that uh, you go and meet and get embedded in it and get to live within it. I think uh, the people that, like us, live most of the time in the big cities, we will forget about what's the fill of nature. There is not even a game trail to follow. For 200 miles, a path through almost impenetrable growth must be chopped, cut away. Then the vehicles crawl forward. On wide tires, they march across logs, rocks, and oozing, decaying swamp. There is no flat country. It is either up or down. Some grades are too steep. And then winches, foot by foot, drag their loads up the pitched ridges. One day, their progress is 500 feet. But the expedition moves forward, and gradually a routine emerges. The cutters go out ahead of us, and they, they start cutting all the, uh, the vines, the small trees that they can get with the machete. They, uh, they seem to move along quite well. They, uh, they're learning what it takes to get a jeep to a certain point. Uh, then we follow up uh, usually about an hour, hour and a half behind. Each night a new campsite. Fires are lit to try and diminish the mosquitoes. Fresh, pure water is manufactured with their filtration equipment. Food is prepared. Uh, we have dined uh, with uh, some relish on uh, a basic diet of vegetables, uh, which are freeze-dried peas, corn, freeze-dried uh, chicken, and freeze-dried beef, an excellent beef stew, a very excellent pudding, uh, along with some freeze-dried strawberries, which we mix into various and sundry things, including <laughs> Stew occasionally by mistake. Another day they make two miles. Then somehow a rhythm of the march comes together. They make five miles. Then seven. They become on the spot engineers, expert bridge builders with their specially designed ladders. Uh, 
if we wouldn't have had the ladders, as far as crossing little washes, some of them have been, uh, and we're five feet deep to 30 feet deep, lay them down, line them up to the japes, and you crawl down into the creek and then crawl right back out the other side. Sometimes you have to winch yourself up, but uh, most of the time we're able just to drive onto the ladders, drive into the creek, drive right back out of it. The pace is slow, but it is constant. They are weary, dirty, infected with bites and stranger people. But despite it all, they are determined to press on, and like the explorers before them, to enjoy the adventure for its own sake. Not many more places in the world that man hasn't gotten to. This is one of the few, and this is kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. There's a spot that finds its way into a special kind of man. It lights a fire deep in his soul that tells him, yes, you can. He can get out from behind his desk and go try something new. Driving up the side of the world is just the thing to do, cause he's driven by a dream. A rainbow is his guide. He gets his strength from Mother Earth, and a brilliant story lies. He's driven by a dream, crossing rivers, climbing trees, to turn the heartaches and the joys into treasured memories. This spark becomes a torch, as it's passed from man to man. You can see it in their faces, as they go land to hand. Each step makes him taller, fills his heart with pride. When you're driving up the side of the world, you take it all in stride. Cause he's driven by a dream, a rainbow in his guide. He gets his strength from Mother Earth and a brilliant story light. He's driven by a dream to the jungles and the seas. To turn the heartaches and the joys into treasure. Smith says it another way. With the equipment we had, uh, and again, it's the people we had, we just had an unbeatable team. No question about Yankee it. Yankee ingenuity, hey, equipment, Brent's and men to match the Darien. Yeah. While the most hazardous part of the trip is over, 
Ahead lies 10,000 miles of Central and North America. Back on the road again, they press on to Panama City, which welcomes them with open arms and all its finery. In addition to tall tales, explorers are expected to bring home souvenirs. And so they do. Then on the road again, up the spiny ridges of Central America, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala. The landscape flashes by. Then into Mexico, and an excursion into the past and the ancient riddles of Yucatan. The highlight for me was a little uh, uh, side trip out to Tikal to check out the Mayan, uh, the Mayan ruins on the Yucatan Peninsula get a kick out of that the, uh, to see these uh, temples built up 200 feet high in this steaming hot jungle and then climb to the top and then look over for a mile and mile and mile of nothing but trees it's just amazing to me through parts countryside and the road winds north Crossed the border into the states they left behind 84 days ago. Their first meal in the United States. What else? There is a special feeling about your country when you've been away from it. I don't think you can you can appreciate it until you until you've been away for a while. And you come back, and then it's very very special. But the trip doesn't end here. They promised themselves they'd go from tip to tip. And so the road beckons them on. Up through Northern California, they head for the border. Then the Maple Leaf of Canada sets their course northward. Canada and the whole North Country to me just really strikes a chord in me for some reason. I, in British Columbia somewhere, it, it feels like home. I wasn't, I didn't grow up there or anything, but there's something really appeals to me about it. And I've always wanted to go to Alaska. I know I wrote a story about driving to Alaska when I was in third grade, and I just remembered that on our way up here. That it's been a long time, but I finally achieved it. The misty forests of British Columbia into the fabled Yukon Territory. They cross through some of the most magnificent scenery in this hemisphere. they descend through the Brooks Range. Mark Smith speaks of the contrast. We did hit snowstorms coming up through Canada and also into Alaska. We hit some fierce winds, heavy drifting snow that cut our visibility down to about 25 feet. Uh, temperatures down to 50 below zero with the chill factor. And it was completely different than what we've done. We've gone, uh, temperature, temperature changes or spreads have gone from uh, well, say 50 below to 105 degrees. That's about 155 degree, degrees difference in our temperatures. Alaska is just a knockout. It's, it's much more even extreme than I thought it would be. I think I imagine it more just tundra-like, but when you're just out in an area where it's just the only two shades are white and light blue. The entire landscape is white, and the sky is just a pale blue, and almost like being in a void or something. It's really a beautiful sight. The last miles rush by, and then Prudhoe Bay. The expedition de las Americas is ending. Box score, 122 days, 21,000 miles. Five flat tires, a busted axle, and enough memories to last a lifetime. They celebrate. They reflect on the journey. Well, we've completed 21,000 mile trip from the tip of South America to the tip of North America. It's been a great and fantastic trip. It's been a 
real experience uh, in many, many ways. The type of terrain, the people we worked with and had with us have been just fantastic. We really have. We've been a great group of fellas. Cooperation and fellowship, it really uh, gives you faith in humanity again when you see a, a bunch of fellas work like this. And then here we've been almost five months, and now suddenly the whole thing is is over. It's uh, it's kind of sad. We've there's some good people along, and we've got some good friendships developed, and uh, it's going to be kind of rough to go back to work. Uh, I didn't ever have any doubt that we were not going to make it to Prudhoe Bay. I had the same feelings there that we would conquer any obstacles there as we did with REM. I don't know what we've accomplished, really, truly. Uh, record books, I think, is out of the question. It's uh, something we didn't do for a record. I think we just did it for adventure, and I'm pretty sure that everybody felt the same way. What has happened, really? A dozen next-door neighbor Americans have done something nobody else has accomplished before, at least like this. They've driven almost half the Earth's circumference. They overcame obstacles that have halted armies. And they did it all for the pure joy and adventure of just doing it. There's a spark that finds its way to a special kind of man. Lights a fire deep in his soul that tells him, yes, you can. He can get out from behind his desk and go try something new. Driving up the side of the world is just the thing to do. Cause he's driven by a dream. A rainbow is his guide. He gets his strength from Mother Earth and a brilliant story lies. He's driven by a dream. Crossing rivers, climbing trees. To turn the heartaches and the joys into treasured 